Hey everybody, Jazzy here. We are quickly moving through the early days of Thrill of the Grill, my Twitch world, with Warly. By year 3, a lot of the early game stuff had gotten done. Ruins have been cleared and reset, and our board supply is steadily increasing. I haven't fought Toadstool yet, but I'm still focused mainly on the gathering of resources and setting up Warly's base to be as self-sustaining as possible, and much of year 3 was dedicated to that effort. But we also finally fought Dragonfly. Now the first thing I'm doing in Autumn is I'm heading back to the Mandrake Forest to pick up all the logs left behind by our Berger run last year. I'm also looking to restock my silk supply, and any time I visit the forest is a pretty good excuse to farm some spiders. My chest zone is going to eventually have 144 chests, which will cost about 5 chests worth of boards, and that's not even including boards for cobblestone, scaled chests, or any decorations. So if I seem a little log crazy in the early days, I hope that you understand why. By some miraculous coincidence, Berger 2.0 appears just as I'm sweeping up the wreckage of his predecessor. This time, as promised, I'm going to take him somewhere a little safer where I can keep him alive as an indentured wood servant. Now, I love farming deciduous trees. The poison birch nuts that spawn are a total joke to Berger compared to the actual threat that tree guards represent. We're gonna just topple them like they were never there to begin with. And in addition, any extra birch nut seeds that we don't plant, I'm just gonna throw into an ice box back home and use for generic crock pot filler. The first downside to deciduous tree farming is that it's very random. They could take a half a season or more than an entire season to grow. Also, they only give two birch nut seeds from their tall form in autumn, which makes that the only real practical season for sustainable farming. I'm gonna be messing around with planting batches of birch nuts at different times of year to try and find this good time for a consistent autumn harvest with Berger. And this will help to supplement any evergreen farming I do with a forest stalker. With Berger parked in the deciduous, very close to the oasis, I'm finally gearing up for Dragonfly. This run, I'm reevaluating the timing of a lot of boss fights, and up until now, I haven't really thought of a pressing need to fight Dfly. Now that I'm actively working on a base though, I really want to start building scaled furnaces for my kitchen and scaled turf for my chest zones. It's going to be a lot more forgiving with bone armor, and I get the sense that I will save a lot of resources on this fight because I've killed Fuel Weaver first. As usual, I'm setting up stone walls to manage the larva. Now normally I place a row of walls that intersect the lava pool because their pathfinding AI doesn't recognize the pond and they'll get trapped on it while targeting me. The only downside to this is sometimes Dfly will spawn a few larvae on your side of the wall. So I had some viewers suggest I create a wall with a sign. Now I've never done this before so I gave it a shot, but because of the way I placed the sign, the walls were not as tightly placed as they could have been and that ended up giving me trouble during the fight when a few slipped through. Regardless, the fight went pretty well, and it gave me a chance to learn this new strategy for managing the larva. The easy way to remember sign placement is to start at a tile edge, then place the sign one notch to either side. That should allow you to very tightly place walls on either side of the sign. Fast forward to winter. Day 164 was clause number three. The prize? Not a Krampus sack. All things considered, it was probably the worst loot I've had so far. The shroom skin was cool, but until I'm able to dupe shroom skins, it's not gonna do me much good. I would have much preferred a mandrake, a bee queen crown, hell, even an eyeball. A couple days later, I was working on catching some bees for bee boxes when I get a hound wave. Now, there's a pangle nest nearby, so I tried using them to distract the hounds. I seriously do not understand the workings of the pangle brain. I'm typically used to the entire waddle waking up and committing beak aside on any mobs attacking a herd member, but that night the hounds picked them off one by one and they did absolutely nothing. They then proceeded to murder my Shadow Chester. I should have just taken them out myself from the start, but honestly I was expecting more from the pangles. By the way, here is my trick for farming the beehives in winter. If you light a beehive on fire, the bees all come out, but the moment you extinguish the fire, they go back inside. So what you gotta do is light it and then quickly catch a bee while the hive burns. This will aggro the other bees and they will continue to target you after you extinguish the hive. It's a bit of a workaround, but if you just swing at the hive, you get killer bees coming for you and you can't use those to craft bee boxes. And a couple days later, I'm back at my base placing a few bee boxes down. I'm placing these so that they will not be loaded while I'm in the main part of my base, so I'm counting on their passive honey production. You actually don't need to sweat the butterflies too much if this is your intention with bee boxes because as long as there's one flower within like seven tiles of a bee box, it will slowly generate honey when unloaded. I definitely want honey as Warly, but 
but I'm not going to overdo it. I'm going to be making honey poultice, volcano chauffeur, ice cream, jelly salad, honey ham, and honey seasoning. But none of these really call for a massive amount of honey, and I imagine I'll end up using most of it as generic filler for non-meat crockpot foods. So for the near future, 8B boxes is going to be plenty. Right at the end of winter, I get ambushed by clops. Now, I don't have my bee queen crown, but I do have a single bone armor, so I'm tanking, then kiting while the bone armor's on cooldown. The fight demonstrated pretty clearly the situation you are trying to avoid on day 30 when you first fight clops. That is, being insane and trying to manage nightmare creatures and clops at the same time. The terror beaks are actually easier to take out than the crawling horrors because they are faster than clops. But the crawling horror moves at the same tick, so they'll always be moving right underneath clops, and they're really hard to hit without getting pounded by ice shards. Oh well, I got some good kiting practice in. And, because I killed her in the last couple of days of winter, my reward is a clops free winter next year. But after that stress fest, I'm ready to go gather some grass. I'm planning on eventually making a grass gecko pen, but transplanted grass takes a while before it's ripe for spawning geckos. So in the meantime, I'm just gonna set up a basic crop farm so that I can start building up my supply of grass. After Last World, I'm not gonna rely on twiggy trees for twigs, just because they seem to need a lot of space in order to consistently drop twigs. Besides, I think I can get by with just harvesting saplings when I'm in need of twigs, and it might actually take less time. Maybe we'll do a lure plant sapling farm later if we really feel like getting creative. I'm also doing my first big stone fruit harvest. Now, I'm gonna use the quick drop function to pile them up in stacks of 10 and use a single piece of gunpowder to blow them all up. I find that it lags the server less than using a weather pane on stacks of 20, and I actually think it's cheaper than using a weather pane. Eventually, I'm gonna make a set piece with sprouted stone fruit that will not require fertilization, but it's gonna take a bit of grinding to get all those sprouts. Day 191 is my first moonstone event. I'm setting up a basic perimeter of statues just to keep the mobs away, but eventually I'm gonna wanna set up some pig houses nearby so that I can farm more moon rocks during the event. The moon collar staff has 50 uses and I'm gonna be using it liberally during ruins clears. Then once I deconstruct a low durability staff, I can go activate the archive and get the forgotten knowledge blueprints, but I'm not in a huge rush to get that done. In summer, on my way back to clear the ruins, I ran into a patch of depths worms and I wasn't paying attention to my hunger and I started starving. I made a pretty big mistake right here, and I took a bite of the meaty stew just as they all bit down on me. The lesson here is to be aware of the time it takes to eat food. Many crockpot dishes have a long eating animation, and you're basically a sitting duck during that time. So make sure you don't have mobs bearing down on you when you stop for a meal, unless it's something like raw food or trail mix that has a shorter eating animation. The worms are once again proving to be one of the biggest threats to my livelihood in this run. I get another Depths Worm wave while fighting Ancient Guardian. This is actually a great time to get an attack, because Ancient Guardian will help me to distract and kill them. In reality, there's only a few bosses in the game that can make a periodic wave attack extremely difficult. Examples of this include Dragonfly, Antlion, and Kloss. But none of the cave bosses pose a huge problem. Toadstool and Ancient Guardian can both handle worms splendidly, and Fuel Weaver is pretty safe because worms very rarely spawn in the atrium. And to make up for the first abysmal loot from the large ornate chest, this haul is lovely. Lazy Explorer, Thulacite Suit, a full pickaxe, six thulacite, and two yellow gems. Very nice indeed. But unfortunately, that is the extent of our good fortune in the labyrinth because the rest of the ornate chests have very little to offer. If there's one place where I am not shy with the lazy explorer, it's in the labyrinth. Much of the time, the ornate chests appear at the end of a really long path, and walking around the labyrinth for loot can sap a lot of time during a ruins clear. So if I see an opportunity to hop around, then I'll probably take it. I can deconstruct any 5% lazy explorers when I get back to the station, and just craft up a new one with orange gems. It's usually better to leave the ruins with full durability staves rather than low durability ones. And after a few ruins resets, we'll be swimming in orange gems anyway. After a productive season of clearing the ruins for the second time, I'm back at the station. This time I'm going to make four star collar staves and four thulacite crowns. I forgot to make thulacite walls, but I will definitely get them next time. But I'm also heading back with a half stack of purple gems and red gems. I really wish I were able to get more blue gems down here, but they do not seem to drop as much as the reds. And that's it for year three. 
Next time we're going to return back to the surface in autumn for some tree harvesting with Berger and building the gecko pen. I hope you're enjoying the recap videos and I will see you very soon over on Twitch. Take care.